You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. We had a full house this week in the book, huh? We looked at three reformers this week. Three reformers, chapters 22, 23, and 24. Okay? So, in a book? Okay? So, I don't know if anybody's got a book you can look on with, maybe? Okay. Thank you. All right. So, first up is um, Orich Zwingli. Orich Zwingli. So, as is our typical, what do we know about Mr. Zwingli? What do we learn from the book about Mr. Zwingli? Just in terms of his life and all those kinds of things. Born in Switzerland, 1484. That would be the 15th century. Okay? One year after Martin Luther. Yes, exactly. So, he and Luther were contemporaries. They did not know each other at in the early years, not until they actually met, and we'll talk about their their infamous meeting. But yes, they independently came to similar conclusions. How did how did uh, Zwingli come to his conclusions? Back to Scripture. Yes, yes. So as we talk about things to emulate, that is certainly something to emulate. There is it. Zwingli, while well, he was a trained Catholic priest, served as a priest. But his back-to-the-Bible approach transformed him, didn't it? Okay, good. What were the the early areas of his theology that the Scriptures reformed? Your, Your author listed them on page 157. Things he began to jettison. Indulgences, yes. Icons, yeah. Mm, statues, icons, sure. What else? What was the most important one that it caused him to jettison? The foundation of Roman Catholicism. The Mass. Yeah, with no Mass, no Roman Catholicism. Right? It is the foundation of it. So yes, you got a Roman Catholic priest abandoning the means of salvation in the system, which is the Mass. So the scriptures made a serious impact in his, in his life for him to let go of these things. That's right. Okay. What else do we know about him as a, as a person? How did Luther view him initially when he, he read of him, before he met him, as he read of him? Yeah, I thought he was fanatical. Yes, that's right. Page 158 there at the top. Even Luther regarded some of it as fanatical. In other words, he let go of things that Luther wasn't willing to let go of. Okay? So, so he really was a reformer, wasn't he? In fact, the the author says, and I think um, he's, he's on firm ground to say this, that Zwingli is really the original reformer. The original reformer was Zwingli himself. A lot about him that is very worthwhile emulating. What was his approach to preaching? He preached through books of the Bible. That was completely revolutionary for its day. Completely revolutionary. For us, it's like, oh, of course, is there any other way to preach? Yeah, actually there is. And preaching through books of the Bible was something that was unheard of. Probably hadn't been happened in a thousand years. So, okay, good. What was his organizing principle of theology? Why do they name him the original reformer? Again, page 158. The sovereignty of God was his organizing principle, yes. That's right. He saw everything through the lens of the sovereignty of God. Okay? Good? All right. 
So he had, well, let's just finish his life. Did he live a long life? No. How old was he when he died? 47. How did he die? Killed in battle. Yes, killed in battle in 1531 at the age of 47 in the Catholic Protestant Wars. Right? They led their Protestant army into battle and he was killed. He was killed. Kind of again, sort of unusual, right? The warring preacher. <laughs> okay? His life is marked by two controversies one of which is a serious black mark. But what are the two controversies that marked his life? The Lord's Supper Supper is one, yes. Baptism. Baptism. Infant baptism, but yes, baptism. Right, exactly. So, let's deal with the, the Lord's Supper part first. So... We're on page 159, and we are introduced to some theological terminology that we will dig into in more detail later in the syllabus, so I don't want to get lost in it here. But it had to do with the understanding of the elements. So there were essentially three positions. Do you remember? Did you mark them? Did you highlight them? Circle them? Do any way to designate that? What were those positions? Transubstantiation. Yes, transubstantiation, which is the Roman Catholic position. Okay, good. Consubstantiation, which is the Lutheran position. And then we have Zwingli's position. What would we, how would we characterize that? A memorial. Okay, do this in remembrance of me, the memorial view of the Lord's Supper. Calvin had a kind of a twist. We'll talk about that later when we actually deal with um, uh, communion and so forth. So what was the controversy? And what could have been? Huh? Imagine if it hadn't turned out the way it did. So what was the controversy? Yep. Okay. They were brought together in a... In a meeting (laughs) to try to determine whether there was and could be unity in the early Reformation movement between the Swiss and the Germans. You got to remember, so this is at a time when the, the Reformation is still in its pretty much infancy stage. And so Roman Catholicism is the, is the dominating theological understanding and had been for a thousand years so think what might have been had Zwingli and Luther been able because they substantially agreed on everything except this if they could have agreed then there could have been those those movements and countries could have been drawn together and and the history of Europe could have looked different did I miss something the Wonder Twins, yes, there you go. But it was not to be in God's good providence, now was it? Probably for the better. God does all things well. So yeah, I guess we would have to conclude for the better, wouldn't we? Okay, so what was the problem? And what did it reveal about the character of these men? Stubborn. Very stubborn men. Very stubborn men. Yes, that's right. So Zwingli called Luther's view of communion pagan. That's a good opening position. It it really helps to reconcile people. Yeah, cannibalism, pagan cannibalism. Okay, that's my opening position. That's what I stake out. What do you think? Yeah. And what was Luther's response or, or approach to the whole thing? Yeah, I'd rather eat, you know, I'd eat dung if God told me to. This is what it is. Yeah, I actually got out of his shoe and banged on the table. Yeah. Yeah, it just wasn't going to come together. Was not going to come together. Which is, 
Again, in God's good providence, but it's still kind of a cry in shame. <laughs> but it speaks about the character of these men. These were hard men. Hard men. Hard times require hard men. So that, that inflexibility was also a strength that was necessary for them to stand in the gap and do what they did. Stand up against the entire weight of, the, of Christendom, of the Holy Roman Empire, right? So yes. So did it end amicably? They shook hands and, and so forth. No, they despised each other. They despised each other. We probably have coffee now in heaven together, you know, and talk about it. Can you imagine we were so dumb? But yeah, did not end well. Did not end well. Okay. Well, now let's, what's the next one? Let's get to the next one, because that one is even more troubling, isn't it? This was the controversy over baptism. What was the issues? He rejected that infant baptism removed the guilt of original sin. Yes. What else? Yes. That's right. That's right. So let's back up a, a, a bit. Your book talks about this. Uh, Zwingli's method of reformation would, would be to preach against Catholic doctrine and theology and create a, a groundswell of, of support Strength, you know, so providing theological support from his preaching, and then take it to the city council and have them approve whatever change. And then it would be implemented. That was his approach. Because why? How did he view the world? Did he view a church and a world in any kind of separate form? No, it was superimposed. But that was his methodology. So, he, he brought up some young men alongside him. He trained them in, in Greek and Hebrew, taught them to read the languages, taught them to exegete the scriptures. And what do they do? They read the scriptures. And no infant baptism. Yeah. So now his students have pushed beyond their master but even before that, they were discontented with his method of reform. They just, they just thought the idea of just preaching against these things and, and then waiting till there was a groundswell and then they could get the city council to agree to make a change was being disingenuous and not honoring to the word of God. So it was basically, if God says it, we need to do it. And whether they don't like it or not, that's their problem. So... You've got Zwingli saying, chill out, right, you young stallions. But they, they didn't want to chill out. And they kept pushing him and pushing him. And then finally, when it came to the, to the issue of baptism, and baptism tied to membership in the church, he, he, they went where he could not go where he would not go. Did they separate amiably? No. No, they didn't. What happened to him? He, he super submersed them. Yes, they rounded them up and drowned them all. Not all of them, but many of them, of his own students. It's really hard to fathom that. Hard to fathom that. But that is indeed what happened. And again, they're all in heaven. Having a cup of coffee together. So, okay. Let's see. Is there anything else we want to say about Mr. Zwingli? Other than this, maybe, that his view of the Lord's table is a very 
popular view in evangelicalism. It's probably, it's not a uniform understanding here at KCC. I'm probably pretty positive of, but I would imagine it's well represented here as well. Right? Normally on the front of a communion table, you'll see letters in remembrance of me. <laughs> so taking a Zwinglian remembrance view. Okay. All right. So that's Ulrich. Let's turn over to the Frenchman. What do we know about the Frenchman? He wanted to be a lawyer. Here we go again. Did he almost get struck by lightning? No, that was Luther. He wanted to be a lawyer too. <laughs> yeah. Maybe all lawyers ought to be struck by lightning. I don't know. I could go there. Okay. Yes. He was training for law. He had that legal mind, that, that exegetical training as a lawyer, right? Contracts mean what they mean. They, they, you don't allegorize a contract. You exegete it. Okay? So he, that was his training. Very brilliant. What else do we know about him? Yes. So he had to flee Paris. Why did he have to flee Paris? Yes, French King Louis the whatever, one of those numbers, I can't remember which one it was. Does it tell us? No? Okay, it's, it's one of the Louis. Was um, persecuting the Huguenots, the French Protestants, rounding them up and executing them. That's the persecution. So he fled Paris. And where was he going and what was he intending to do? By this time, he had dropped out of law school and he was in pursuit of scholarship. Yeah, he just wanted to be left alone. He, wanted, he, was, a, he was a retiring kind of man. He, he's not a people guy. So he wanted to read books and write books and exegete scriptures and, yeah, wasn't to be, wasn't to be. So how was he recruited into pastoral ministry? You've got to love this. They threatened him, exactly. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Guillaume Farrell bushwhacked him on the road, right? There was a, there was a roadblock, it was an army roadblock, if I remember correctly, and uh, so he had to make a, a side detour. And so um, Farrell came and said, we want you to come to Geneva and be our pastor. And he said, I don't want to go to Geneva and be your pastor. And he, what did Pharrell say? Yeah, God will punish you if you do not come. Don't you love that? <laughs> he was a sucker, yeah. I mean, that is such a clever recruiting tactic, right? If you don't come and do this, you're being disobedient to God. And if you're disobedient to God, he's going to curse you. Man, I do Adventure Club if you try that on me. <laughs> so he went to Geneva, didn't he? How'd it go? Rookie pastor in Geneva, how'd it go? Crash and burn. Not good. Not good. Why? Yes, his reforms divided the city. Because in Calvin's mind... He wanted to turn Geneva into what? A, theod a theocracy, right? The rule of God here on earth. You should have read, if, yeah, if he'd only read the greatness of the kingdom, he would have known better. <laughs> Didn't work out. City council wasn't really interested in these kinds. I mean, they wanted to, they wanted Christianity they could control. And they certainly didn't want preaching that was calling them out. So what did they do? They ran them out of town. They ran them out of town. Okay? So he's gone for a few years, back to his life of solitude, gets married, marries a widow, uh, interestingly, Anabaptist widow. So we'll just hang on to that tidbit. We'll come back to it in a few weeks. 
And um, then he's approached again, isn't he, to come back to Geneva. What's the recruiting tactic? Yeah, you go with, you go with what works. <laughs> exactly. You need to come and be our pastor. God is calling you to come here and be our pastor. If you don't listen, listen to God's call, you're being disobedient to God. If you're disobedient to God, he's going to curse you. But back he came. Back he came. Picked up in the same text where he left off and just continued preaching. Kind of a, how productive a preacher was he? Three times a week. Preached three times a week. Yep, that's three separate sermons. It's not the same sermon three times. That's three separate sermons a week. Plus all those other duties, writing, so forth. He's well known for something that he wrote. He revised it five times. The Institutes of the Christian Religion, first published at 25 years old. Why was it written? Do you know? And who was it dedicated to? I don't think the book tells you. It doesn't. But if you've read the Institutes and you bothered to read that part of it, you would remember. It was written, it was dedicated to Louis. It was written in defense of the Christian of the of the Christian faith, Protestant Christian faith, to a Catholic king. Revised and expanded five times over his life. Final version, roughly fifteen hundred pages. It is the magnum opus, probably, arguably, the most significant statement of Reformed theology, even today, Calvin's Institutes. Okay. Quite a guy. Quite a guy. Did he establish his, uh, his theocracy? Was he successful? Kind of. Yeah, kind of. Talk to me. Somebody was impressed with it. Do you remember who? This guy wore a skirt and long socks. John Knox, the Scotsman. He was impressed. He studied there in Geneva under Calvin. Remember what he said about Geneva? The most perfect school of Christ. Yes, Knox tried to bring it to Scotland. Tried to bring that to Scotland. Okay? Good. What was the organizing principle for Calvin's theology? If it was sovereignty for Zwingli, what was the organizing principle? Page 166 in the middle. I mean, predestination was important to Calvin. It's a big place in the Institutes, holds a big place in the Institutes. But it wasn't the organizing principle. Justification. Justification. Right? How is a man made right with God? The doctrine of justification. Notice at the end, at the bottom of page 166, Calvin was explicit that Christ's sacrificial work was a substitution that actually took the punishment for sin in the place of the sinner, somewhat in contrast to Anselm's idea of Christ's death as satisfaction, displacing the need for punishment. Remember, we looked at Anselm's theory of atonement. Calvin wrote, Hence, when Christ hanged upon the cross, he makes himself subject to the curse of the law. It happened this way in order that the whole curse, which on account of our sins awaited us, or rather lay upon us, might be lifted from us while it was transferred to him. He emphasizes our union with Christ, the, the benefits, the spiritual benefits and blessings that come by virtue of our union with Christ. These are important themes in the Institutes. It's kind of interesting, wasn't it, on page 167, when uh, his emphasis on our union with Christ, some criticized that and said that if you emphasize that, then it removes the incentive for people to behave themselves, you know, basically... If grace abounds, let sin abound all the more. And uh, so Calvin dealt with that. He admitted his own struggles with sin. What was his major sin struggle? 
anger. Anger. That's why you don't see smiling faces. <laughs> oh, poor John. Struggle with anger. Yes, he did. And in fact, his anger boiled over, I would argue, in a very shameful event. And that, it's not, again, it's not in your book, but it has to do with the, the judicial execution of Michael Servetus. Okay? Michael Servetus was a Unitarian. So he was a heretic, but he, he was warned by Calvin, do not come to Geneva or you will face the penalties. He came to Geneva anyway. He was arrested. He was tried. And Calvin presided over him being burned at the stake. Okay, so that is a black mark on the name of John Calvin. Okay, again, a hard man for a hard time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. What had changed? Yes. Evidently, in God's providence, they the city, enough people in the city missed him that they were willing to invite him back. And, and so what changed? It would ultimately be the spirit working through the preaching of the word that changed the hearts of people as he brought reforms to the city. But again, think of it like um, like Jim Osmond being the pastor of KCC and mayor of off, or of uh, Sandpoint and presiding over the you know the police department and everything else, right? So he'd tell you on Sunday morning what you can and can't do, and then he'd enforce it <laughs> throughout the week. This is a time, and again, we will look at this later in your syllabus. This is a time when there is a nearly perfect overlap of the ecclesiastical and the, and the civil authorities. They could not conceive of the world in which we live. So, an ecclesiastical crime, which is heresy, <laughs> is a civil crime. And it was punishable by civil offense. It's good for us to yes, it is. It was a very bad thing. Yeah, we cannot justify it. We can, and that's a fool's errand to justify it. We should explain the times. We're all products of our times. It, for us, it's a completely foreign idea. It was not considered to be a great offense in his day. But, yes, face it. The other allegation you'll hear against Calvinism is that John Calvin, um, let me back up. Martin Luther encouraged music in the church. John Calvin did not. In fact, he forbade music in the church. And so that will be another criticism of Calvinism, is that it's anti-culture. So, yep, you'll... If you run into anybody who spent any time thinking about it at all, they will raise those issues with you. Right. Yeah, they're clinging. Exactly. So it's a fool's errand to get into a debate with them over that. But if it's somebody raises it to you, you know, you don't want to go like, oh, I never heard this before. Now what do I do? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. All of the all of the key doctrines are clearly available in the scriptures. And that's where we need to be. You know, maybe as an aside here, this is a common practice among unbelievers, is to, is to knock you off into a side issue. You've got to stay on the bright red line. Preach Christ and Him crucified. Stay on it. They try to veer you off. Acknowledge it if it's a, if it's a legitimate observation or something, but get right back to the task at hand. Okay. Don't bury. Okay. Uh, I think he mentions in here that he was in poor health, doesn't it? Yeah, constantly. yeah. Why was he in constant poor health? He didn't eat. Yeah, he didn't eat. He worked too hard. 
He suffered from terrible migraine headaches, yeah, hemorrhoids, like serious, afflicted with hemorrhoids and migraine headaches, and yet produced the quantity of caliber and caliber of, of um, theology next to Jesus that he did. That requires you to stay in your seat, <laughs> focused for long periods of time. And any picture you see of him, he's always wearing a funky hat. I, I should have brought a picture of this. I forgot it for tonight. I'll bring it next time. Funky hat. You know why they wear a funky hat? Oh, this is funky hat. You know why they wear funky hats? <laughs> Maybe. Because it was cold where they lived. <laughs> These people lived in northern Europe. And it, they lived in stone houses. And they were cold. So, you know, if you're a little thin on the pate, they would wear a hat to keep it warm. Okay? All right. He's on the front of the book. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, that's one that's one rendering of him. The more famous one his face is thinner. Yeah, I was gonna say Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's well <laughs> somebody somebody thought he looked like that. They painted it. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything else about Yes. So this is, uh, we were talking about a little bit before we got started. This is uh, what I would call a live issue in theology. And what I mean by that is that it is not clear cut. So there are people who, uh, in search of the Institutes, do not believe that Calvin clearly articulate, articulates uh, a definite or limited atonement. Understanding that the L in tulip is not a Calvin creation, it's not a John Calvin creation, that comes later, we'll talk about that. So uh, he makes statements that can be interpreted in, in such a way that say that, yeah, we're not sure that he really did believe that. There are others who, who think he did. Dan brought in a, a paper by a, a very reputable theologian. He's gone to be with the Lord now, Roger Nicole. And in that, after his examination of the, of the writings and so forth, he concludes that he did believe in a limited or definitive definite atonement. That was his conclusion from the writings. Um, so, but also knowing that Roger Nicole believed in a limited and definite atonement, so he may have found what he wanted to find. So, that's another issue that you may have thrown up in you, at you, by someone who spent any time thinking about it or reading about it. You know, maybe these they may be these throwaway lines. Oh, not even Calvin believed in Calvinism. <laughs> Well, Calvinism isn't, no, it's not his creation. So, good, good question. Maybe one other um, thing I want to bring out here on page 169 before we roll uh, forward to our last man for the evening is the, um, this uh, concept of a magisterial reformer or a magisterial reformation. Okay. So, it's in the middle of that large paragraph there on page 169. It says, Together these branches are known as the magisterial reformation, in that they believed that the church and state, the magistrates, should cooperate closely in the work of God on earth. Okay? So, Zwingli was a magisterial reformer. Calvin was a magisterial reformer. Luther was a magisterial reformer. That is, a, that is an understanding of church polity. It still exists. There are still state churches. The Lutheran Church in Germany is still a state church. Okay? Again, this is a foreign concept to us, and it's a foreign concept to us thanks in no small part to the character we're going to look at next in chapter 24. Uh, they would find it from the Old Testament. So they imported Old Testament understanding of a, of a theocratic Israel into a New Testament. So they all see the church as, as the first church member was Adam in their theological grid. And so, yes, they would import. 
Well, postmillennial eschatology derives from it. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it came in through the Puritans into New England. Puritan New England uh, were also magisterial ref of, of that ilk. Okay. So, for example, the first Baptist was uh, Roger Williams. He was driven out of Massachusetts because he was a nonconformist. And they drove him to Rhode Island, and he founded Rhode Island as a free colony. In other words, you could believe what you wanted. Not so in Massachusetts. It was congregationalism. Okay. We'll get to that, though, later in the syllabus. We're going to look at the 13 colonies, and it's very fascinating to see what the theological grids were in these 13 colonies and how it spread out. All right, so let's talk about uh, Menno Simons. What do we know about him? He was the first Mennonite. <laughs> that is a correct statement. <laughs> yes. He was a radical reformer. Why is he a radical reformer? What does that mean? It says he wanted to reform the Reformation. Yes, he wanted to reform the Reformation. That's correct. That's right. Why is it called radical Back to the roots, right? Page 172, first paragraph in the middle. The term radical comes from the Latin term for root. The connotation here being going back to the roots, namely the New Testament. Oh, isn't that interesting? That Simon and his followers wanted to get back to the book. The, the guys who got deep immersed, they were Anabaptists who wanted to get back to the book. Just interesting. Okay, good. What stands out? Go ahead. Yes, yes. That's exactly right. Can a, can a Roman Catholic be a believer? Not for long. It will draw him out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who? Somebody. Yes. Yes. Reformation is breaking out the discovery, and we're and we're going to next week get to this in the syllabus when we talk about monasticism. There's all kinds of things to criticize about monasticism, but there's one overwhelming, compelling uh, value to it historically in that period, and that was the recovery of the ancient documents, which fueled the Reformation. Had they not recovered the scriptures in their original tongues, Greek and Hebrew, and, and committed themselves to a serious study of it, there would have been no Reformation. All Reformation is found in, in true exposition of the Word of God. Without it, there is no Reformation. So yes, it broke out all over the place. As men independently, through their study, the Spirit of God was opening their eyes. Right? He was big on the priesthood of the believer. Yes, he rejected pedo-baptism, professed believer's baptism, as did all the Anabaptists. That's correct. Okay. How it stands out about him. How long did he live? How old was he when he died? 65 years old. That actually uh, should stand out to you. He lived a long time, particularly is belonging to a, to a group that was being persecuted by both Catholics and Protestants. Pressed from both sides. He lived a long time. Most Anabaptist leaders lived 18 months before they were captured and executed. Always on the run. So, okay. He had some kind of hinky theological understandings. Hmm? He was a pacifist, yes. He was a pacifist. Set that up. Um, most... Anabaptists were pacifists, still are today. Okay, Mennonites, as 
Josh said, his first Mennonite. Yeah, the Mennonites are named for him. They are pacifists. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. That's kind of a hinky sort of idea. Yes. When it came to justification, his take on it was definitively not Calvinistic. (laughs) Yeah, that's right, Eric. What he stressed was is that if you are a true believer, a true follower of Christ, it will show in your works. And so he was very focused on the good works. He did not say the good works saved you. We say by grace through faith. But he uh, rejected uh, perhaps what was he was observing around him, perhaps, that people were claiming justification on a legal basis, forensic justification, which we do believe is true, is what the scriptures teach, but then their lives were not changing. And that was uh, something that was just unreconcilable for him. So he, he was kind of a guy who would say, don't tell me what you believe, Tell me how you live, and I'll tell you what you believe. There's something to be said for that. It's not the whole truth, but there's something to be said for that. Feels manipulative, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah. So maybe he was the first seeker. You notice the uh, free churches here. We're at page 175. His followers became known as Mennonites. They're still thriving today. They are. Any of you come from a Mennonite background? Anybody here, Mennonite background? No? Anybody from a Mennonite background? No? Okay. Um, Still thriving today, for sure. More distant modern relatives of Anabaptists are Quakers, Baptists, Congregationalists, and the free churches in general. That is, free from the state. Okay? Free from... Oversight by the state, free from financial support by the state. In much broader sense, their views on believers' baptism and holy living are still alive and well in much of evangelicalism. So, can we find things about Simons to criticize? Sure, we can. Can we find things to commend him for? Yes, we can. On balance, would we say his life was positive for the advancement of the cause of Christ? I think we would conclude it is. It is. One of the negative consequences of of too much focus on the external behaviors, Christian behaviors, is that the gospel can be lost in that process. And uh, there are many Anabaptist descendant churches that have descended into liberalism. They've lost the gospel. So they focus on good works and societal change and those kinds of things, Quakers, people like that, and so forth, and they've lost the gospel in the process. So it is a danger. Uh, well, Mennonites, uh, n- n- not always. There are, there are more fundamentalist Mennonites who would adopt more of an Amish dress. Next time. A brief and strange interlude at the Council of Trent. Richard Hooker and James Arminius. That ought to be a riot. So go to the beginning of your syllabus, um, maybe page four, where the course outline. Is it page four in yours? Not sure. It is. Okay, good. Page four. We begin tonight on the third of the six major sections. So notice the years, 590 to 1517. Okay, 590 to 1517. And we've entitled this Popes. We've subtitled it Darkness and Withdrawal. So we're going to be looking in the next three weeks, tonight at Islam, and then monasticism, and then finally the rise of the papacy. So you kind of get the idea of the darkness and the withdrawal in those three topics. Okay, so page 19, the rise of Islam. Islam, the word means submission, is the youngest and fastest growing of all world religions. 
the youngest and the fastest growing. So let me give you some statistics here. In, uh, in 2010, there were 1.6 billion Muslims worldwide. In the year 2020, the number is now 1.9 billion, 25% of the world population. Okay, 25% of the world's population. Two-thirds of all followers of Islam live in the Asia-Pacific region, not the Middle East. Okay? We often associate it with the Middle East, and rightfully so, it's the birthplace, and we'll talk about that. But the majority of the Muslims, or the followers of Islam, do not live in the Middle East. They live in Asia and the Pacific area. So, Indonesia, 229 million Muslims. Pakistan, 200 million India, 195 million. All right, so those are your three largest concentrations. Christianity, and according to 2020, and this is broadly defined, very broadly defined, so it include Roman Catholicism and anything that even had a whiff of, of something Christian to do with it, was 2.4 billion, 31% of the world population. So still the largest on that basis. Islam is next at 1.9. Secular, uh, non-religious, 1.2 billion, 16%. And then Hindu, 1.2 billion, 15%. Okay. The four... Uh, let me see if I... Oh. Yeah, let me say this. 90% of the Muslims are Sunni Muslims. 90%, which means 10% are Shia. Okay? That is a great question. What is the difference? And I will give you the difference. So, <laughs> the, the, I will give you the difference in just a second. The largest Shia Muslim country in the world is Iran with 69 million, 93% of their population. This is the old Persian Empire. Then Azerbaijan, Bahrain, and Iraq, 21 million in Iraq. Okay, These are reasonably recent statistics. Okay, so the question, what is the difference between Sunni and Shia? Um, Shia comes from... The word uh, Shia Ali, which means uh, partisans of Ali. So that's what the word means. Shia means partisans of Ali. So who's Ali? Well, when Muhammad died, there was a leadership vacuum and there was a, a succession conflict. And so uh, the Shias reject the first four caliphs. These are, the, these are the leaders of Islam following Muhammad. They reject the first four in line, and they believe that his nephew, Muhammad's nephew, Ali, was the rightful heir. And so they are partisans of Ali. And that's the, the origin of it. Sunni and Shia do not like each other. They do not like each other. Okay, and the and the feud is goes back to the beginning. Okay, so Muhammad himself was born in A.D. five seventy in an idolatrous and polytheistic city by the name of Mecca. There were Jewish and, quote, Christian communities also represented in Mecca at that time. So this is the 6th century A.D. So you can see it's the youngest world religion by far. These, quote, Christian communities were, were Christians that had been expelled from Christendom because of their heretical views, and they had fled east and taken up residence. Muhammad was orphaned at the age of six. 
He married a wealthy widow when he was 25 years old. At age 40, he withdrew to a cave and experienced visions. This is his autobiography of sorts. Experienced visions uh, in the year 610. He began preaching against idolatry. He was surrounded by idolatry. He began preaching against idolatry. He was driven from Mecca along with a small band of followers in 622. And they moved to a, an area or a community by the name of Medina, which is about 300 miles away. They survived by raiding caravans. So they were desert raiders. <coughs> In 624, they defeated uh, an army from Mecca and instituted jihad. And as it was originally conceived, jihad was that the soldiers got a share of the spoil. They conquered Mecca in 630. He died in 632. Writings that have been left behind, uh, probably the most significant, there's the Quran, of course. We'll talk about that in a minute. But there's also what's called the Hadith, H-A-D-I-T-H. And it is a, um, it is the Muslim book of rules. It's considered sacred and incumbent upon every Muslim to believe and obey it. It was compiled over 200 years after following Muhammad's death, and it purports to be verbatim quotes from what he had said. Everything was written, other people wrote. That is correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. Come back to him again. So, I'm on the top of 19. A wealthy merchant named Muhammad. He claimed an angel spoke to him in visions around approximately 610. These visions were written down by his followers in a book called the Quran, where Quran means to recite. Followers of this religion are called Muslims or Muslims. They don't use that word Muslims very much anymore, but and it means uh, those who submit. That's what it means. Muhammad was repulsed by the rampant immorality and idolatry of the people of his home city of Mecca, and he took up public preaching against it. 622, he was forced to flee. We talked about this. 630, they defeat the army from Mecca. He returns triumphantly to the city. He destroys all the idols in the city except for the black stone. The black stone which was an ancient meteorite. And he proclaimed it to be the most holy shrine in Islam. Now, the legend surrounding the black stone is that it was given to Adam by God at his fall, his expulsion from paradise, and that it was originally white. And as through the years, as pilgrims have kissed it and touched it, their misdeeds have been transferred to the stone and it has become black. Okay, that's what they teach. It's actually uh, not a single stone anymore. It's it, Through the years it fell a few times. It's been broken into eight, but it is bound together by a big silver band. And there it is. There it is. <laughs> I can see... I actually can see that. <laughs> he said it looks like a prison toilet. <laughs> you said a Muslim means one who submits. Yeah. Does Islam, the word, have a meaning? Uh, the word Islam means submission, I believe. Oh. Yes. Yeah. So that is where the stone is housed in Mecca. No, this is the stone. This is the stone. And that's the silver band. <laughs> yeah, it's it's in it, it's in here. <laughs> yeah, you can't have it out in the open. Uh, I don't know if that's a painting or a photograph. I'm not sure. Uh, I honestly don't know. I got it off the internet, so I'm not sure. Yeah, so you can kind of get an idea of the crowds. Okay, I mean, you can. This is a big deal. To make a pilgrimage once in your lifetime. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yeah, I think it... Yeah, I think that's right. With some kind of a curtain that covers it. Yeah, exactly. Yes. 
can we rescue this conversation? <laughs> Men's theology, yeah. We can't mock it. <laughs> that is true, because there's something very pagan about this whole deal, for sure. Yeah, they're trying to get close to touch it. Yeah, I mean, take a look at the crowd. Can you imagine trying to walk around it seven times and then get close to touch it? There's also um, some historical evidence that it was actually stolen <laughs> as well. That's where it originated from, is they stole it from some other polytheistic tribe. But anyway, it did not come from God to Adam. Pretty sure about that. <laughs> Pretty sure it wasn't white to begin with either. You know what I'm saying? All right. During the next two years, prior to his death, he strengthened his grip on Islam in the land of Arabia. From there, his followers launched out across Africa, Asia, and even into Europe, spreading their religion at the point of the sword. This threat of the Islamic invasion, this is important now, this threat of Islamic invasion constantly nipping at the borders of Europe. So it swept across North Africa. Now you remember, North Africa was the, the nexus of, of early Christianity. Think about the theologians that came out of North Africa. It blew through North Africa and conquered it all and then crossed and began to come uh, through Spain up into France. And uh, this contributed to a certain measure of paranoia among the rulers of Europe for the next thousand years causing them to view disloyalty to the state and the state religion to be acts of sedition, which would ultimately bring the Islamic scourge upon them. They lived in mortal fear. It swept through the East, and the Eastern Empire eventually collapsed before it as well, Constantinople and so forth. Okay? So it swept through it all. Now, there was a major battle in 722 A.D. Here, he's worth increasing his size a smidge. Let's see, wait a minute. This, one of my favorites from, hold on. Uh, there we go. Can you see him? That is Charles Martel. Charles the Hammer. Charles the Hammer, that's right. In 732, at the Battle of Tours, in southern France, they stopped the Islamic invasion and delivered Europe. Delivered Europe. Okay? Again, think about it. If it had not have happened and Islam had swept through Europe, there would have been no Reformation. So, significant event. Okay? Yeah. There for you map people. You can see the Battle of Taurus. All right. Okay, here we go. Five doctrines of Islam. This is what all Muslims must believe. This, if you believe these things, you are. This is a doctrinal statement, as it were, as it will. So the five doctrines. God. There is only one true God, and his name is Allah. Allah is all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful. Angels. The chief angel is Gabriel, who reportedly appeared to Muhammad. Notice the influence. Remember I said that in Mecca there was a Jewish community. There were Christian community. And, and some of that fed into this. Chief angel was Gabriel, who reportedly appeared to Muhammad. The fallen angel, Shatan, from the Hebrew Satan, and his followers are called the jinn, or demons. Scripture. Muslims believe in four God-inspired books. The Torah of Moses, Psalms of David, the Gospel of Jesus, and the Quran. They believe that Jews and Christians have corrupted the first three, leaving only the latest, the Quran, as Allah's final word to mankind. That is convenient. Yes. Uh, I think it's the Gospels. Yeah. So, and this would be a place to, to if you get into a evangelistic slash apologetical encounter, would be to point out the contradictions, because the Quran itself uh, affirms the very books that contradict it. Muhammad, the last and the greatest in the line of prophets, stretching from Adam through Jesus. 
So he's the last prophet. And then the end times. On the last day, the dead will be resurrected and judged. Those who oppose Allah will be sent to hell. Those who are faithful will go to heaven, a place of sensual pleasures for men. Okay? Now notice something. There's somebody missing from heaven. Did you catch it? Who's missing? Who? Sensual pleasures, but who's missing? Allah is missing. Allah is missing from heaven. You see, because this is, in my opinion, the evangelistic doorway for Islam. And that is, there is no way to have relationship with Allah. He's a solitary, singular God. No fellowship, no love, no communion. And he's not there. He doesn't want to be there with you. Do they believe Allah is eternal? They do believe he's eternal. Self-sufficient? Yes, all that. So a lot of misinformed Christians will kind of say, well, you know, our God's monotheistic, their God's monotheistic. We call him Yahweh. They call him Allah. He's really the same. No, 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 no. Not at all. Not at all. What's the deepest longing of the human heart? It is, it is a restored relationship to our Creator. That is our deepest need and, and our greatest desire. And there's no way to be reconciled to Allah. And you will be without Him for eternity. Islam is a very lonely religion. A very lonely religion. Okay, so here's my book plug for you. It's a book called Delighting in the Trinity. The Lighting in the Trinity. It's about 160 pages, thereabouts. I could not commend it to you more highly. And it will explore some of the things. The author author is Michael Reeves. R-E-E-V-E-S. Michael Reeves. That's a V. Victor. I have not read Andrew Rappaport's What They Believe. Um, Oh, okay. Good. On world religion, yeah. Good stuff. Yep. Okay. So, the five pillars of Islam, essential for salvation. Here they are. They're up there. To become a Muslim, one must publicly state that, quote, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. Prayer, you must participate in prayer, to kneel and bow five times a day in the direction of Mecca. Notice how uniform it is, by the way, and how it flattens society. In other words, all over the world, different cultures, it's all the same. It's a, it's a very, it's a world of um, black and white. There's no color to it, like the world that God created. So you uh, kneel and bow five times a day in the direction of Mecca. You have to give alms. That's 2%, 2.5% of your annual income to the poor and the needy. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that it has made inroads into the African American community, particularly the poor part of it, is their involvement in the social needs. Fasting during daylight hours for the entire ninth month, Ramadan. During a person's lifetime, he must make a pilgrimage to Mecca and kiss the lax stone among other ritualistic activities. If a person is physically unable to go, they may send someone else in their place. Unofficially, the sixth pillar is the jihad, or the holy war, whose purpose is to defend or spread Islam. Men who die in jihad go immediately to heaven and receive their 72 virgins. Okay? So, again, no, Allah's not there. You get 72 virgins, that's the best it gets best it gets okay so uh yeah i would say that's probably true yeah um women are not highly regarded in islam not at all right allah let me let me just say this allah views the creation of humans as servants we're created to be servants the men view the women 
to be servants. So, like your God, they become like their God. We become like our God. Our God is outwardly looking. Our God is interested in fellowship, love, sharing, relationship. We become like Him. It transforms us. You become like what you worship. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.